You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 2nd, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, update on food allergy research and treatment. Our presenter is Dr. Edwin Kim. He's the director of the UNC Food Allergy Initiative in the Division of Allergy Immunology at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Okay. Um, good morning and welcome to our second talk for Conferences for Online Allergy um, lecture series. Um, today on October 2nd, um, we have with us Dr. Edwin Kim. He is the director of the UNC Food Allergy Initiative, the program director of the UNC Allergy and Immunology Fellowship Program, um, and the medical director for UNC Allergy and Immunology Clinic. And he's going to be speaking with us today on updates on uh, food allergy research and treatment. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kim. Glad to be here. Thanks, Jordan, for getting things set up for me. Um, so it's been fun. I've been able to give this talk now for a few years. Um, and uh, year to year, there hasn't been a lot of changes, but I do feel like this year um, that there have been some cool advances as well as some uh, new directions that I wanted to be able to share with you all. So let's get right into it, actually. All right. So I do want to start with some disclosures that I have across different food allergy companies. So I consult for both the immune and DBV companies, uh, and I'm on the clinical advisory, clinical medical advisory board for DBV technologies. I also consult for some other allergy uh, companies that aren't directly related in treatment uh, that you see here. And then uh, we've been fortunate to have grant support from multiple sources, uh, both at the NIH as well as through FAIR uh, and then the Wallace Foundation. And so uh, the objectives, so I do want to start with, um, again, just a general overview of the food allergy problem. I think most people in this audience are going to be well aware of the problem. I still think it's important to set that stage of, you know, how big is that problem and, and how important is it that we have a treatment. I'll talk about the current management of peanut allergy, uh, as well as the, the benefits that come with it, but some of the drawbacks or some of the things that we need to continue to work on. And then I'm going to talk about research to date on different modalities of peanut immunotherapy beyond the oral, and finally wrap up with some future therapies that uh, I think are going to be very exciting for the future of food allergy and peanut allergy treatment. All right. So first things first, again, making sure that everybody uh, in the audience is talking about the same thing when we talk about food allergy. Uh, I'm guessing... Uh, I'm not guessing. I'm sure everybody in the audience who is actually seeing food, uh, food allergy in their clinics uh, very clearly realizes what we consider to be food allergy is definitely not the same as what patients necessarily think of as food allergy and not even what other providers not in, in outside of the field of allergy think about. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll bring up the same figure that we've used for many years because I think it really shows it well in our top section that de demonstrates sensitization. So the concept that you're exposed to whatever food or allergen it might be. In this case, we have a picture of a peanut. The, uh, the immune sort of um, results that occur from that that ultimately lead to the, pres uh, to the creation of peanut-specific IgE, uh, and then that IgE finding its way onto the surface of mast cells. And again, I always try to make this point with our patients that that first exposure, really, you're not going to expect to have any symptoms because really there you're just becoming sensitized, creating the IgE, but it's not on an infector cell in order to cause actual symptoms. Of course, once you are sensitized and then you have that subsequent exposure, uh, then there is the cross-linking of the IgE on the surface of mast cells and other effector cells, and then the release of histamine, of course, is most important, but these other um, chemicals as well. And then I always like to sort of review this, the classic symptoms of food allergy as well in anaphylaxis, because again, when we talk to our patients or when we talk to other providers, um, uh, they have a laundry list of symptoms that they see as related to food allergy, but identifying what is coming from an IgE-mediated food allergy versus, I guess, what most of us are calling these days intolerances, I think is important, uh, especially before we start talking about treatment. Because uh, already in our clinics, I've had a lot of patients asking about the treatments I'm going to talk to you about today uh, for use in, in um, intolerances and other types of reactions that probably are related to the food but are a completely different mechanism and would not be expected uh, to have any response with our treatments. 
All right. So uh, again, how big is the problem? So these are stats that we show all the time uh, in different sort of graphics. And this is a nice one that came from the FAIR website. And it just makes the point that it's a really big problem. And they even have started to use the word epidemic. 32 million Americans have food allergy. Ruchi Gupta has done some wonderful work just to really try to hone in on what are these numbers. And the one on the right, I think a lot of us have seen uh, for a while now, this idea of one in 13 children. Uh, FAIR has kind of represented it as two kids in every U.S. classroom, which I think really hits home for a lot of us, especially if any of us who may have kids. Um, I know for myself that peanut-free tables were just not heard of. I mean, they didn't exist when I was a kid, uh, but now it seems that every school out there or many of the daycares, if not most of the daycares, have some form of this. Um, so clearly a problem in kids. But I think what was surprising was one in 10 adults um, are suspected to have a, a food allergy as well, which is a pretty huge number, uh, showing that this is, you know, not sort of a little pocket problem with just kids, but really affects Americans and just um, people uh, globally. Um, so something that we definitely need to continue to, to focus on and see what we can do with or, or do for. And so what have we been doing up to this point? Uh, it's been pretty wimpy, if you ask me. So our standard of care has really been identify what the patient is allergic to, uh, and then recommend strict avoidance and whatever guidance we can give towards that avoidance. One of the things that has helped with that has been this Food Allergy Labeling and Consumer Protection Act um, that was passed. And this is the, the law that, um, if you're not familiar with it being a law, you're at least familiar with seeing it at the supermarket. So this is a law that states that the eight major food allergens, so our peanut, milk, egg, wheat, soy, um, peanut, I'm sorry, tree nuts, and shellfish, uh, and finfish all have to be uh, labeled very clearly. So these are the black and white, uh, very clear-cut warnings that you see on the labels, like you see here in the picture, contains milk. There's no wishy-washiness at all about this, uh, despite a lot of words right above it that you really can't pronounce or don't even know what those things are. Unfortunately, uh, very quickly after that, what we started to see are all of these voluntary labels. Uh, and unfortunately, these voluntary labels are unregulated and for many, many patients uh, have been very confusing. So the example that I have over here um, on in this bottom right corner, in this, I guess, pink, orangish color a box here, that's sort of, that's the legal one. So it contains milk, eggs, wheat, gluten. So it's very, very clear cut, no wishy-washiness. Uh, but then right below that, there is this language of, um, you know, uses nut ingredients and what does that mean? So for a lot of patients, that has, again, created confusion of does that mean it's in there? Does that mean it's not in there? Do I avoid it? What should I do? Even at our provider level, what I've noticed is when you talk to different allergists out there, they're also going to interpret those voluntary labels very differently. I've, ha I've met some allergists who across the board say avoid them. You know, there might be a chance that's just not worth it. Others will differentiate and say, well, traces is probably risky, so don't go there, but made in a plan is probably fine. Uh, and then even some people who differentiate based on the company. So if there's a voluntary label from a large company, uh, like a Nabisco or something, Keebler, things that we've heard of, maybe that's okay, but a small mom and pop place maybe is not the greatest idea. Um, so you can just very quickly see how this has created confusion. Um, and, you know, really important because reading labels was was and still is the lifeline for many of these patients who are trying to avoid their allergenic food. Now, um, here you see it in the title, but a point I want to make is avoidance is what we've been doing, but avoidance is really, really hard. And first things first, I would say, is reactions still happen. Uh, and um, again, you can just talk to your patient, you know, see this, but in a study form, uh, we've also seen this as well. So there was a prospective observational study done by the COFAR group, and they took, as you see, your 512 allergic uh, infants and just followed them over a bunch of years to see what would happen with their food allergens um, as far as how good were they at avoidance. And, and keep in mind, these are people that enrolled in a study knowing it was observational, and these are questions that are being frequently asked. And what they found here is that uh, a big number, 72% of these patients had a reaction during the observation period. And more than 50%, 53% in this case, actually had more than one reaction in that time period. Uh, and again, for a group of people who know they're being observed for this, I mean, that's um, a bit alarming if you ask me. Equally so, I think a number that I like to look at is this 89% were accidental. So you could say, 
well, 89%, but I could look at the other 11 and what was that? What is that other 11%? And, you know, I've heard this story in my clinic and this, and this study also showed it where um, there are also situations where there is intentional um, ingestion and then reactions and whether it's going to be um, your know, family's trying to see have they outgrown it, whether it's going to be uh, other members of the family, grandparents, in-laws are typically the ones that I see that are implicated in this. I don't want to, um, well, I am kind of pointing fingers, but but I've heard stories of those as well where, you know, there's sort of this general line that I don't remember anyone having food allergies when I was a kid. This can't be real. And then experimenting and finding, unfortunately, the hard way that, yes, this is a real allergen. So, uh, again, just reactions are very, very difficult to avoid, uh, even in the best of cases. Now, beyond that, though, I think one aspect that, of course, families living with this have recognized, but I feel like the field is really coming around to understand more is, um, you know, avoidance has a lot of consequences. And while it was sort of our simple answer for many years, I think it's very clear now that uh, it leads to a very terrible poor, uh, quality of life for these uh, families. And you can argue um, that Kids with, with food allergy, uh, I'm actually a parent of a food allergic kid, 99.9% um, .9 of the time, essentially when they're not eating that food, completely healthy, completely normal. So what's the problem? Uh, but there is still a problem, I think, with having an allergen, even when you're not exposed. And here are a few of the key points I wanted to make. So number one, many of these kids and many of these patients who have food allergy, there's a strong sense of self -isola uh, social isolation. Uh, who they make friends with uh, may be very limited. Um, uh, and then tied into the second uh, bullet of a restriction of daily activities. So a lot of these kids may be scared to go to birthday parties, scared to go to playgrounds, uh, even in school situations, maybe you know, petrified to be able to play with friends, um, sleepovers, overnight camps. A lot of these activities that many of us probably grew up with or participated in that were just part of being a kid, these uh, kids with food allergy, many of them either don't do it or approach it in a very, very different way than someone who may not have an allergy, um, you know, having to come with a food allergy action plan and an EpiPen and a lot of these different restrictions, it changes that activity and unfortunately in many cases in a negative way. On top of that is, is really a constant fear. And again, when they're not exposed, they're typically perfectly healthy, but there is this constant fear that that next meal, that next ingestion or somewhere out there could have a trace amount or a cross-contamination or something that could lead to an allergic reaction. And I think this sort of never relenting anxiety that comes with it also uh, really, really weighs on these patients, on these uh, young kids as well as their families as well. And then finally, uh, there is a huge financial cost that's associated with food allergy. And again, Ruchi Gupta helped us with this to, to identify that um, approximately $25 billion a year is estimated to go towards food allergy uh, or living with food allergy. And a big chunk, almost $20 billion of those dollars are actually not necessarily just medical care, but the cost of food, the cost of the activities and the different things, the schooling, uh, all those special circumstances that they take, uh, that, that these families have to do for food allergy. Um, and so you can imagine not only sort of this internal constant fear of reaction, but then there's this financial burden, this financial weight on their shoulders on top of that uh, as well. So really, again, this uh, poor quality of life that comes uh, from food allergy. And I would make the point here with the physical and quality of life uh, concerns, we really do need a treatment for, uh, for food allergy. <clears throat> So let's get right into it then. So I do want to start with um, just a, a quick uh, review, and I won't go into the details of, of this. Um, our own fellows, I might have them tell me exactly what every cell on here is, but for our group here, the main point I want to make here is this is a look at the GI, uh, the GI tract, our GI lumen, and there are multiple um, ways that our GI tract can access the lumen and get access to antigens, and ultimately it's designed to induce oral tolerance. If you think about it, nine, you know, everything that we eat is foreign to our bodies, but we're not having anaphylaxis day, you know, day in and day out. So our body is designed to, to create oral tolerance, and it generally works pretty well. Unfortunately, though, um, in, in some cases, there is a breakdown of this oral tolerance, and that's ultimately how we end up getting our, our food allergies. So again, you have 
these allergens that get through, um, and ultimately they lead to this TH2 response that you see over here um, with the cursor, uh, with problems across humoral immunity, with our effector cells like our mast cells, and then our eosinophils here as well. Now, there are ways to suppress this, and our body naturally does this, and whether through regulatory uh, T cells or otherwise, and IL-10 and TGF-beta as our suppressive cytokines. And you see some of the changes that we would hope for uh, that would help to suppress, suppress allergic reaction and create this oral tolerance. So really, uh, when we're thinking about treatment, um, we're always thinking on the surface level of a food challenge and how much can they eat. But at the end of the day, really what we're trying to do here is get to that immune system and how do we block this food allergy pathway. And so I wanted to use that just to set the stage to, to talk about some of our treatments. And so um, the form of treatment that we've studied more than anything else is immunotherapy. And the, the uh, definition that I've tried to use for this um, is an exposure to gradually increasing doses of allergen uh, to retrain the immune system and then ultimately to induce tolerance. And this retrain, I think, is something important that I, I use that, that term. It seems to work pretty well with, with my patients. Um, and basically talking to them how it seems that their immune system sort of has become broken to allow for allergy to happen, and we're trying to retrain it to understand that it should not be reactive to it. Within immunotherapy, the three most common uh, or the three forms or modalities of it that have been most studied are epicutaneous uh, immunotherapy on the left, epit, OIT or oral immunotherapy in the middle, and then sublingual immunotherapy on the right. And I'll talk about each of these um, uh, in, in sequence. So first I'll start with oral immunotherapy here in the middle. And so oral immunotherapy, we've been studying this for quite a while now, over 10 years. And, uh, you know, at the heart of it, it's ingestion of what you're allergic to. So if it's peanut, you're eating peanut flour, or if it's, if it's milk or whatever else it might be. Typically, it's in pretty large quantities. So it's ingestion of milligram to gram quantities of this food allergen. In our research, we've typically done it in a flour form. So again, like I mentioned, milk flour, peanut flour, egg flour. Um, and some of the things that, that helps with is going to be, of course, standardization of what they're eating, uh, the amount of protein that they're getting uh, from, of course, a purity point of view. And then also uh, using a flour form helps us with the important piece of measurement. So we do feel like there is uh, an importance in immunotherapy of controlling the dose and escalating at a certain rate, typically low and slow. And so flour gives us a way to actually measure that in a very accurate way versus if we were using pure food, uh, where, again, it may be possible, but probably not to this degree of accuracy. Now, um, I think a lot of us uh, may hear peanut flour and think, oh, this sounds wonderful, and I'd love to just eat some or sprinkle it on something. It must be great. Uh, but I will clarify here that we're talking about a uh, defatted, unsweetened, uh, flour that is just um, not great. It's typically not very palatable on its own. And so how it's ingested in oral immunotherapy is it's mixed with a vehicle food. Uh, in our studies, it's typically been applesauce or pudding or sometimes, uh, like you see in the picture, ice cream. Uh, but really, again, there, um, practically speaking, I think this is something that families would, would try to come up with, what kind of makes the most sense for, for that child that would um, you know, um, allow for the best compliance. The one caveat that we have with all of our families is it needs, clearly needs to be a food that they are, know that they are not allergic to in order to not confuse any symptoms that may pre, uh, arise from actually doing it. So this is a uh, figure that's been shown uh, uh, probably 100 times at this point, if not more than that. And this was um, the, the, the key uh, figure from the first double-blind placebo-controlled study of peanut oral immunotherapy that was actually conducted by my co-fellow, uh, Pooja Varshney, while we were both training over at Duke. And here, what she looked at were um, kids that were allergic to peanut uh, that were ages 1 to 16, and they were treated with peanut oral immunotherapy for 12 months. They were escalated to a, a very, very high amount, so 4,000 milligrams of, of peanut and of peanut protein, which is the equivalent of probably about 12-ish or so uh, peanut kernels. At the end of this 12 months, they actually had a blinded food challenge, a double blinded food challenge to see what that reaction threshold might be. And this food challenge was uh, capped at 5,000 milligrams. And what you see from here is a pretty dramatic effect. People on treatment all across the border up at the top, people on placebo pretty clustered down low. And so everybody that was able to complete the treatment 
um, and got to the food challenge past the entire 5,000 milligrams with no symptoms at all. So, you know, I've estimated that in the range of about 17 to 20 peanuts. Um, you'll see estimates of 240 to about 300 milligrams um, being the equivalent of one peanut kernel. The other aspect, though, that I think is important is looking at the placebo. So again, um, kids that are allergic to peanut not treated at all, and they reacted at about 280 milligrams, so about one peanut kernel. So I think just to kind of put into a reference of how much does it take to actually get sick, and then really the next question that comes with that is how much protection do we need? So at least in this case, it seems like, again, most of the patients, it didn't take much, uh, about a peanut kernel or less, for them to, to actually have allergic symptoms. Now, I mentioned with those slides showing sort of those immune, the, the immune, um, uh, the allergic immune response, uh, that we're really talking about problems at the immune system level uh, that ultimately lead to the outward problems on food challenges. And so we looked at that in this uh, double blind study of peanut oral immunotherapy. And first of all, what you'll see is with skin prick testing, representing mast cell response, what you see is a big drop in this wheel size after 12 months of treatment uh, with oral immunotherapy. Uh, when we did our immunoglobulins, we looked at IgE and we looked at IgG4. And I'm going to come back to IgE because that's a somewhat of a unique story. But IgG4 we think of as a potentially protective uh, antibody from food allergy. And here what we see is a big increase uh, over the 12 months of treatment that you don't see over in the placebo group. And then on the far right over here, we see two very common TH2 cytokines, IL-5 and IL-13. And you see decreases in how much cytokine is measured whereas uh, placebo is fairly, fairly flat across when you look at these median bars. Now, IgE, I'm coming back to because, interestingly here, you would think, well, IgE is bad for you, so on treatment, it should go down. And in this case, we actually found statistically significant changes, but they were increases. And that's been something interesting that we have found across all of our food allergy studies, that early on in treatment, with that initial exposure to the actual allergen itself, we almost always are going to see increases in peanut-specific IgE, that ultimately over a period of time, typically by the time they reach about, say, 9 to 12 months, returns back to baseline. And then with extended therapy, what we end up seeing is then the IgE falls below baseline. But for those first few months, uh, when we were doing these studies, um, I would be lying if I didn't say I was a little bit alarmed and worried, like, what is going on with our patients? Why are the IgEs double, triple, even 10 times as much as what they started? Are we making them more allergic? Uh, but it is something that we have seen across our food allergy studies. And actually, if anything, represents that, yes, they are being exposed to the treatment itself. Now, going back to the slide where I showed you um, the problems with the immune response, again, just highlighting those areas. It's uh, in oral immunotherapy seems to target the, humo uh, the humoral immune response, so these B cells. And I mentioned how it caused the changes in the IgE and IgG4. And then it also seems to be blocking those mast cells with the skin test. And then the IL-5 and the IL-13, these eosinophil, pro-eosinophil cytokines, these TH2 cytokines as well. So again, peanut OIT seems to be really getting in there and doing what we're hoping to do of suppressing that allergic response. And then that outwardly shows with the ability to eat a large amount of peanut on a food challenge. So once we um, convince ourselves that this is something that can work, some of the next questions that came up, of course, would be, well, can it be a cure? So is there some way, is there some um, strategy for peanut OIT that it's not just a temporary thing, but can actually be a long-term cure? And so these patients that were studied, as well as um, uh, a handful more that came onto the study after that first paper was published, were treated up to five years. And then we did a food challenge to make sure, again, that they had this desensitization effect, this ability to eat a large amount of peanut uh, with minimal or no symptoms. And then we actually stopped the treatment uh, for a month. Uh, and stopped any peanut exposure and brought them back and tried to see if that desensitization, if that protected effect would last at least for one month. And what you see over here on the left is this is the desensitization food challenge. So everybody who got here is across the board at the 5,000s. Um, but I do want you to pay attention to the blue and the red colors. And a month later, what ended up happening is um, we had a bunch of patients that are represented in blue that were still able to maintain that 5,000 milligram um, food challenge without any symptoms at all. But then we did have a good chunk, about 50% of those patients that fell off. Most of them didn't fall off much. This looks like a big jump here, but actually the way food challenges work, you may all know, 
they are given in stepwise doses. So this is really representing just a single step down from the food challenge, although again, it looks like a big jump. Uh, we have one patient uh, that unusually uh, lost a lot of that protection with just a month off of therapy. And this one strange one over here, uh, what this represents is this patient did pass the 5,000 milligram food challenge, but then what we were routinely doing at that time was what we called an open feed, where we gave them peanut food after the food challenge to uh, in one sitting as opposed to in these graduated doses. And in, in that setting, the patient did have some symptoms. So, um, so that's why they're considered a failure despite getting the 5,000 at that food challenge. So it did look like um, for some patients, at least a month out, we're able to maintain that protection. But at least half, if not more than half of those patients started to lose some of that uh, benefit. Now, again, keep in mind the blue mench, uh, represented the ones that were able to eat 5,000 milligrams a month off and the red were not. And so what Dr. Vickery had done, who had headed up that study in the paper, he tried to see if there was a way to predict who would be those ones that maintain that benefit versus the others. And here what we're looking at is a graph of IgE. And, uh, and he graphed it over time. But if anything, I think just when you look, even from afar, the red were the ones that did not maintain their um, uh, their protection a month off and the blue were the ones that did. And it's pretty easy to see that the red are just higher. And so it did seem that lower peanut Ig at baseline uh, led to a, a better or a lot more last, lasting response at the end of treatment. And so then he took sort of the next idea of, okay, well, if low Ige is a good thing, how do we find those people? Who has low Ige? And what we know is that many patients, uh, when they're first diagnosed, when they're young children, their Ige is typically low and then dramatically will increase over those first couple of years. So maybe that opens up an opportunity uh, for us to intervene. And so he uh, designed and then ran what, was, what has been called the DEVIL trial, and it's a long acronym that I always forget sort of what it stands for. Um, but the focus here was looking at young children uh, early on in their diagnosis of peanut allergy, so 9 to 36 month olds. And so we've not really gone down to this age before this time to see if oral immunotherapy is safe and if it can work. Um, and then what he did was uh, he treated those folks, uh, those little kids, for uh, up to three years, and then had them also, again, have uh, a period of one month off of therapy. And what they found in this study was across the board, there was, a if you took all comers, an 80 about 80% of these patients were able to pass, again, that food challenge a month off of peanut oil immunotherapy. So up from the 35 to 40% that we saw in the older age group in the previous study, here we saw almost 80%, suggesting that um, either an age or an Ig or both seem to have a very good effect or, uh, or create a good opportunity for patients to respond to peanut oil immunotherapy. So that led to uh, what has been called or what is called the IMPACT trial. So this is run by the Immune Tolerance Networks, uh, sponsored by uh, the NIH. And this is a five-center uh, study of peanut oral, immun oral immunotherapy in that same young age group, one to four-year-old children. What's different here is in the DEVIL study, uh, rather than having blinding, they actually had looked at two different doses, 300 milligrams, or the equivalent of one peanut, versus 3,000, 10 peanuts, um, and did not have a placebo group in that particular study. Of note for the DEVIL study, what they seemed to find was 300 versus 3,000 performed equally well, which was not necessarily something we had expected to find. Um, now, in the IMPACT trial, they tried to address this placebo um, issue and brought in a placebo as well as making it a multi-center multi study across the five sites you see here at UNC, Arkansas Children, Stanford, Hopkins, and Sinai. It was a much, much bigger study, so 146 subjects, and they were treated for two and a half years. Um, and the maintenance dose in this particular study was chosen to be 2,000 milligrams. So again, if you think of about 300 milligrams as one peanut kernel, somewhere in the range of uh, seven or eight uh, or seven peanuts or so. Now here, uh, being the immune tolerance network, they really wanted to get at the fact is, is this a long lasting tolerance? Because uh, a month off of therapy, you know, I mean, it, it shows that it's not an over, it doesn't, the, the desensitization effect doesn't go away overnight. But is that really something that would give uh, any patient or any provider confidence that the allergy has actually gone away for good? And lacking any sort of um, uh, immune markers that were very, I guess, basically black and white about it, are you tolerant or are you not, looking for a clinical marker, what they decided was six months off of, off of therapy, six months without peanut exposure. That should be pretty clear cut and that would be hard to imagine as sort of essentially by accident uh, or something that will go away. 
This study uh, has, com has been completed and the data is actually actively being analyzed and written up as we speak. And so we're uh, anxiously waiting to see what those results will look like. We hope it'll come out in the next few months because there too, I really feel like that um, when you think about the LEAP guidelines that all of us are trying to implement in our clinics, um, we're going to prevent a lot of peanut allergy, but I think we're also going to be identifying peanut allergy a lot earlier uh, for kids. And to understand what the effects of peanut OIT can be in this very young age group, the age one and the age twos, so I think will be really important to kind of combine together with our approach towards the LEAP. All right. Now, of course, with all this positive research that we had towards OIT, I think we all are familiar now with the A immune company. Uh, so they were essentially born in the middle of all this with the idea that, look, there's so much positive data towards OIT. How do we actually get this to our patients as opposed to only in research studies? And so here you see um, Drew Bird's uh, paper uh, showing the phase two results of their AR101 uh, peanut OIT product. And the maintenance dose for that AR101 was 300 milligrams of peanut protein, uh, coinciding with what we saw in that DEVIL study of the 300 milligrams um, being effective and actually equally effective with the 3,000 milligrams. That was then followed up by uh, the paper that I'm sure we're all familiar with now that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018 uh, that showed the results of the Palisade study, the phase three multinational study of the AR101 product for um, children 4 to 18 or 4 to 17, I guess, with peanut allergy. Here is also a figure that many of you are probably familiar with, and these are the, the, the primary outcome of that Palisade study. And just as a, um, a reminder, so in order to get into this study, uh, these patients had to be reactive to 100 milligrams of peanut or less, so one-third of a peanut kernel uh, or less. So um, very sensitive, highly reactive patients that you would see um, coming into this study. And then the primary outcome was right here in the middle. So the 600 milligram represents the actual um, stepwise dose in the food challenge, but cumulative to that point is 1,044 milligrams. So essentially patients had to react at about 100 or less and then had to be able to tolerate after one year of treatment at least 1,000 milligrams or higher. And what they found was a very, very stark uh, difference. So on treatment, nearly 70% of patients were able to accomplish this, uh, eat 1,000 milligrams with minimal symptoms or none, uh, versus very few, less than 10% on placebo being able to do that as well. They even went higher to look at what happens cumulative 2,000 milligrams as a secondary outcome. And here you see nearly 50% of patients had a threshold even that high uh, keeping in mind that the daily dose here is only 300 milligrams, but they're able to eat 2,000 milligrams without, um, again, uh, moderate to severe symptoms. Now, in this right box over here, it's shaded out. So, uh, again, the study recruited ages 4 to 55, uh, but the primary outcome was built around ages 4 to 17. And in this larger 18 to 55 group, uh, the numbers were pretty small. So you see here the N is 41 for those on treatment and 14 um, for those on placebo. And so these results didn't reach statistical significance, uh, and it probably is a problem with the number of patients that were in this group. Um, so the bars suggest that there might be a difference, but at least um, uh, from a statistical point of view, that was not proven in this study. And so ultimately, um, based on these results, January 31st of this year was an exciting day for food allergy because it was the day of the approval of the first drug for peanut allergy or for food allergy. Um, and in this case, the, they, the immune company named the drug Palforzia, uh, and this is something that now is available at many clinics uh, around the country. Um, unfortunately, COVID-19 probably slowed down the uptake of this drug, and so we'll have to continue to watch over the next few months of what this looks like in clinical practice. Um, but it is, of course, an exciting time, and for me as a food allergy researcher, I think it really not only um, is a treatment that can help directly with our patients, but I really feel like this is something that validates our field and what we're doing and the need for a treatment for food allergy. Now, uh, again, just as much as people are probably familiar with the, this positive data, uh, I think many of us are also probably um, very well aware that there are some concerns that come with peanut OIT, um, most of them around safety. And so the, the PACE systematic review, this peanut allergen immunotherapy clarifying the evidence, uh, paper was uh, published in 2019, and here it, it was. Uh, it took many of the old studies that had been published and reviewed all of those, looking at safety markers. And what they found was, 
a um, significant increase in anaphylaxis frequency, the, the need for epinephrine use uh, when people were on peanut OIT versus on avoidance. Um, and it just, I take it in two ways. Number one, um, it's not necessarily surprising uh, because we are actually giving people what they are allergic to. So I think the risk of allergic reactions, we should expect to be there. And that would be similar to what we do with our allergy shots on a daily basis in our clinics, uh, where we're giving them what they're allergic to um, there. And of course, we're always looking for um, potential allergic reaction in those settings. At the same time, though, it is anaphylaxis, uh, it is epinephrine, and we're dealing with kids here. So this is just a very, very strong reminder that um, this is something that we don't take lightly. Um, so yes, it's potentially reactions and things that we would expect, but at the same time, we absolutely, if we're going to be doing this in our clinics, we need to be prepared, and we need to make sure that everybody is well informed of what they're getting into, and our offices are ready to deal with any side effects that may come with it. <clears throat> Now, uh, again, as Palforzia is rolled out and we start to see uh, clinics doing it, I think we'll really get a, a handle on some of these other concerns. But some of the logistical concerns that I, I can potentially see coming, and we have seen some in our research, the first is, um, you know, this is a daily dosing. So this is not, uh, you know, a once a month or once in a while thing for families. And on top of that, at this point, as we don't see it as being a cure, uh, this is a daily dosing that could potentially go on indefinitely for many, many years, if not uh, forever. And so that's, you know, again, something that I think is very important for families to understand before they get into this, that this is not, uh, this will take work on, on, on their side to make sure that this happens. <clears throat> there are some built-in uh, protections uh, or concerns that we have. So in our clinical trials, we have seen uh, a subset of patients where um, it seems that exercise or concurrent illness and fever can be cofactors that allow for an allergic reaction. Um, and in cases where we have patients who have tolerated dose for many months, if not even a couple of years, suddenly take that dose uh, while having a fever, and then they have anaphylaxis to that same safe dose, or uh, happen to have a vigorous um, sporting activity or whatever else it might be that gets the heart rate up, gets some sweating, uh, and then suddenly that same safe dose uh, leads to an allergic reaction. And so guidelines around palforzia and OIT in general have been to try to avoid exercise and hold dosing while ill as well. So again, just adds another layer uh, for families to be thinking of and how they can um, incorporate this into their busy lives. <clears throat> From the provider and the patient point of view, um, there's a lot of visits that are involved here. So updosing um, can take 11, at least 11 doses to get um, to build up to the actual maintenance dose over the first six months. And so in our busy clinics, just trying to find how can we do this, how can we get people in? And from the patient point of view, how can they get time off of work or time off of school to do this? Uh, furthermore, um, people may miss doses, people may have reactions. There may be reasons where you want to bring them in to have an observed dose. Uh, and so being able and flexible enough to be able to do these kinds of unscheduled visits are not something we're necessarily used to doing in our clinics. Uh, so we need to be really thinking about that as well. And so um, that's sort of the, the overview in, uh, on oral immunotherapy to this point. Now I do want to jump next to the epicutaneous. Um, and so here, uh, there's only um, uh, one version of this uh, from the DBV company. And just to walk you through a little bit of what this technology is. So you see it over here. It's a, essentially a sticker, a Tegaderm looking sticker. And what there is is a foam ring over here. Now, intact peanut allergen is actually dried onto the undersurface of this patch. And then it's applied to the skin with a seal around. And the idea here is just like you see in, this, um, in, in the figure, a condensation chamber is created. The condensation, so you get sweat that's coming up from the skin, it actually then solubilizes the actual peanut allergen on the underside of that, of that patch. At the same time, the thought is that it's opening the pores of the skin to allow for passive transfer of that peanut um, protein that then is able to get accessed by the dendritic cells and hopefully at that, in that way get to the draining lymph nodes and ultimately lead to those immune changes that we had talked about um, before and have seen with oral immunotherapy. Uh, after a couple of positive phase two results, the um, the phase three multinational study uh, was conducted. Here, what you see in this graphical abstract is a little bit um, busy, and I'll try to walk you through it. Um, we have a population of about um, 350 or so kids, meeting age of seven, 
uh, or 356, you see it over here. And the way that they did their um, primary outcome was based on what their initial threshold was coming into the study. So kids who were reactive at 10 milligrams or less of peanut had to achieve at least 300 milligrams on the end food challenge. And those who were reactive at 10 to 300 milligrams had to achieve 1,000 milligrams, so just to show that there is a significant increase um, uh, on treatment. And what they found was um, about 35.3% 35 responder rate for those on the active patch after 12 months versus 13.6% on placebo. Um, so it's statistically different from each other. Uh, but what's important to keep in mind here is that the way that the primary outcome was designed um, uh, in conjunction with the FDA was actually not only looking at the responder rates um, compared to each other, but actually the difference between those um, and a confidence interval around that as well. So this difference ended up being 21.7% uh, with a confidence interval of 12.4 to 29.8%. Um, and this did not meet the criteria that was set by the FDA, so technically considered a, a negative trial. Now, looking into safety, uh, because one of the big perks of the, the peanut patch is going to be, of course, it's very, very easy to do, and the hope would be that it's very, very safe. Uh, and some of the concerns that we might have with oral lumiere therapy, hopefully, would be uh, improved on the patch itself. And what you see first here is about 57.6% of, of the patients reported some form of uh, side effect or an adverse event that came from the patch itself. Um, and, and all of, almost all of these were localized reactions, so redness uh, or itching at that site. Down here, what you'll see is when you look at serious or severe side effects, these were very, very, very uncommon. So I think, again, just a key point that it does seem to meet that safety uh, that we're looking for in a peanut treatment. <clears throat> Now, um, the phase two studies looked at a broader range of ages, and what they found was a stronger uh, um, response in younger kids. That ultimately led to the phase three study focusing on four to 11-year-old uh, children. Uh, but the company at the same time decided, well, similar to what a lot of other folks were thinking, younger, younger may have that chance to be better. And what, how about, if, is that going to be the same for the actual peanut patch itself? And so they designed the epitope study, and you see the clinical trials outgov number over here. And this is a blinded study of the peanut patch with the same 250 microgram uh, dose, that same patch, uh, but here, again, focus on the one to four-year-old children with the hope that uh, capturing, capturing these kids early on in their diagnosis when their IgEs are lower and their uh, theoretically their immune systems may be more open to change or malleable at that point, and they've started doing daily patch therapy for 12 months. This study is ongoing as well as the, the one-year follow-on study called EPOPEX, and we'll be excited to see uh, if there is truly a, a, a difference, a, a stronger benefit in the younger kids as hypothesized. Now, um, unfortunately, on August 4th, though, we got some um, not so great news when it comes to the peanut patch. And um, some of you or many of you may have seen this, but ultimately what ended up happening was the FDA looked at the, um, the application for drug for this peanut patch and decided that they couldn't accept it in the current form. And if you just read here, the, the major concern they had was uh, that the patch was not a hearing um, as advertised or as it should be, and what what kinds of effects could that have on the efficacy? And so uh, the the ac application itself was rejected, and the company was told that they need to go back and actually address this adhesion problem, and then show that um, you know what effects this may have on efficacy as well as safety as well. Um, so um, again, a, a, a Negative news, um, sad news, I think, but my, our hope is that the company will not give up because I do feel like, um, you know, to be able to have something that is that easy and that simple and safe is going to be a great option if we can get that to happen for our patients as well. Now, finally, I want to talk about sublingual immunotherapy. And here, um, uh, I think, again, we have a benefit of a very easy administration. So here, like you see in the picture, given as liquid drops, they're administered under the tongue, held for a couple of minutes, and then just quickly swallowed. Um, the dosing that we use here, typically, uh, our studies have been anywhere in the range from one to four milligrams. And this is compared to the 300 to 4,000 milligrams that has been used in oral immunotherapy. So much, much, much smaller amounts of peanut protein. Um, and then I do make a point here that the sublingual 
treatment itself doesn't have any kind of food taste. There's not a food, there's not a peanut taste, there's not a peanut smell that comes with it. Um, that for some patients might be important. Um, as, as we've noticed, some patients do have a pretty strong oral aversion to uh, the smell of peanut, which is, of course, such a strong smell. Now, I will say that the having tasted it myself, the sublingual actually, uh, it doesn't taste like roses either. It actually tastes um, like medicine. Uh, and if I had to think of anything that it's similar to, I usually tell my patients it reminds me of chloroseptic. Um, so not ideal in that way either. And what effect that would have on long-term compliance uh, with patients is something we don't know yet, but I think would be important and practical to try to understand. And uh, so back in 2011, we actually published uh, the interim results of the first double-blind study of peanut OIT, and we looked at kids age 1 to 11 and treated them for 12 months. And again, this 2 milligram maintenance dose. And if you think of 300 milligrams as one peanut kernel, very, very, very small amount of peanut. And what we found over here is, again, on placebo, it doesn't take much. So the median amount of food of peanut it took for a reaction was about 85 milligrams. On treatment, the median amount was 1710, but when you actually plot everybody out, what you see is sort of three groups here. So you've got the five that maxed out and eight to 2,500 milligrams we pushed them to. We didn't go to 5,000 like some of the other trials. Um, I think at that point we were just uh, didn't know what to expect with peanut sublingual, so we were being very cautious. We had a couple patients fall in the middle, and then unfortunately we had some patients that didn't get too far and didn't look very different than placebo. Um, but here, again, just seeing at least two-thirds of the patients having this type of strong effect um, was very promising and, and really pushed us to continue looking into what sublingual could bring us. And so we kept those patients as well as it recruited another 20 or so more uh, and kept them on treatment for a period of three to five years, kind of paralleling what we do with our immunotherapy in the clinics for, for pollen and for venom. And what we found here is, um, again, I've tried to plot out all the patients so we can kind of get a sort of full transparency in how people did. And again, you see a, a big chunk of people here, actually 12 patients, um, who ate all 5,000 milligrams in this case with no symptoms at all. And what their threshold truly is above that, we, we don't know because we didn't go. But uh, we've got this group over here. And then I'd like to argue we've got sort of, again, another group sort of in the middle here. And unfortunately, we did have a couple of patients who really didn't do much here uh, and seemed to be non-responders for one reason or another. So 32% ate the whole 5,000 milligrams with no symptoms. And when we looked at those patients deeper, so what we had them do is then withhold the peanuts similar to what the OIT studies did and come back a month later. And what we found is 10 of those 12 patients that fully passed, again, were able to eat 5,000 milligrams a month off of therapy. So at least a potential for that subset to have a somewhat of a lasting benefit um, from, from the sublingual. The two patients who reacted a month off of therapy, similar to what we saw in OIT, one dose off, uh, reacted at the maximum dose, so their tolerance level was recorded as one dose below. So not, again, a dramatic decrease to, to baseline. Now, um, I have this additional statistic that I put here because I think we've started to realize that um, uh, more may not necessarily better be better, and there may not necessarily be a clinical importance to being able to eat 5,000, 10,000 milligrams of peanut. Um, and understanding that the median amount of peanut it takes to have an allergic reaction may be in the realm of more than 1 to 200 or even 300 milligrams, what we want to look at is, well, uh, you know, what if we use uh, some interval kind of target? And in this case, I picked 750 milligrams sort of. I Really, I was looking for 1,000, but that wasn't a step in our food challenge. And what we found was at least 86% of our patients were able to actually eat uh, that level, that amount of peanuts, so approximately three peanuts with no symptoms at all. And so at least if you're thinking about protection against trace amounts or accidental ingestions of peanut, it would seem to be that a lot of patients, if not the majority of patients, are, uh, can achieve that on sublingual. So again, very uh, hopeful, um, but we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to sublingual. <clears throat> Safety-wise, uh, again, what we find over here is of all the doses, about almost 5% of doses led to symptoms, but many, if not most, of those symptoms were actually an oral itch that went away transiently. And if you look at the sublingual studies for pollen allergies, so the, the grass sublingual um, and the dust mite sublingual, what you'll see is the exact same oral pharyngeal itching is the, by far the most common side effect. And um, I don't like the idea of using epinephrine as a marker of, of severity, but um, you know, for lacking of, of better markers, here what we found is nobody needed or no one used, I shouldn't say needed, that's what I don't want to do, no one used epinephrine for side effects uh, in, during the sublingual treatment, which uh, you know, I think is still important considering many, if not most of these doses are being done at home without 
um, physician supervision. Immune changes, uh, similar to oral immunotherapy. So uh, a bit of a mess here when I try to represent all of the data, but the median amounts show that the skin tests generally go down. We, again, we have some strange patients where some, some of them have gone up, uh, but generally go down. Uh, with IgE, in this case, since we're looking at baseline and then five years into treatment, uh, we're not looking at that initial bump up that I had described for oral immunotherapy, although um, we do see that when we look at the, uh, the short-term data. But generally what we see here is IgEs that are going down. We see IgG4s that are going up with treatment. And if we do a ratio across the IgG4 to IgE, what we see is, again, generally an increase here as well. And we've been very curious to see if that somehow would correlate with their ultimate um, food challenge response, because clearly you see some folks who have you know, really, really large G4 to E ratios versus some that are, again, much, much smaller. And so that's work that's still being done at the, uh, as we speak. So we've got a couple of other sublingual studies that um, we have been looking at that I'll just quickly touch on. So the one that uh, is completed and is in data analysis at this moment, really we wanted to, again, get at this idea of can there be a cure? Can we get tolerance? And so um, the design of this study, though, tried to have a, a unique ending. So rather than the one month off of therapy, this arbitrary time just to see how many people can keep it or not, uh, we really wanted to be able to identify um, in a better way what happens. And I, you know, our theory going into this is that the desensitization effect is going to wear off in most people, if not everybody, if it's given enough time. And so the way we try to capture that is we have patients who have a baseline food challenge, of course, prove that they're allergic, establish what that initial threshold is, treat them for four years and do another food challenge to show that they've responded to therapy. And then each of these patients was given a random number from one to 17. Uh, and what that ended up giving us is about three patients at each time point, one week off, two weeks off, all the way out to 17 weeks off of therapy. And that the idea is going to be um, that one or two weeks off of therapy, you would assume that most patients probably maintain whatever threshold they were at. Um, but then the longer you go out, you may start to see that threshold come down. And our hope is that we'll be able to actually draw out essentially what may be um, may best described as a decay curve and kind of show how quickly or not quickly does that effect wear off. And so we're excited to see what that data is going to show. And I hope that I'm going to be able to share that with you all by the, the same, this time next year when we're giving this talk again. Now, again, following a theme of the other treatments, we also wanted to see sublingual in the youngest kids. And so that is a study where uh, we've done it combined with UT Southwestern and us, and is funded by the FAIR group. And here we have uh, 50 subjects that are treated for three years. And in this case, we, we did do an arbitrary three months off of therapy. Um, but again, the hope would be that we saw that spread of responders, um, uh, strong responders, partial responders, and then those that were no better than placebo. And the hope would be if we go younger, that perhaps we push more of these people into the full responder range. And the final um, patients for this study are coming in actually this month. And so we're, we're going to be excited to try to look at that data as fast as possible. And if there's any way for us to get this out to you all to see uh, by Quad AI, that would be our goal as well. So now we talked about the different types of immunotherapy. And in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about some other stuff that's out there that's being considered. Um, so first of all, forms of novel immunotherapy. So um, the HAL Allergy Company, what they have created um, is a, like you see in the title here, a modified aluminum absorbed peanut subcutaneous immunotherapy. So essentially the idea of a peanut allergy shot, um, but in order to try to overcome the safety concerns that came up when this was studied 20, 30 years ago, they've actually made some modifications to the peanut itself to see if that would be a way that we can still administer it, but in a safer way. Because if you go back and actually look at the, the, the Nelson and the Oppenheimer studies of peanut, it did suggest that there was a benefit there. It was just the side effect from the treatment that couldn't be overcome. And so perhaps this is still a strategy that works if we can improve the safety. The Estellas Pharma Company, what they've gone is a, done is a very, very unique approach of using actually a DNA vaccine uh, combined with um, a lamp plasmid here, trying to um, in induce a Th1 response instead of a Th2 response and not administering protein that could lead to an allergic reaction, but instead administering DNA that hopefully can be transcribed um, internally and lead just strictly to a tolerance or a Th1 immune response. <clears throat> Another form of novel immunotherapy is what I've been calling um, immunotherapy plus. 
Uh, and so Regeneron Pharmaceuticals has been actually using the dupilumab medication, the, um, the IL-4, IL-13 blocker, um, and trying to see if that combined with the peanut flower, so with this Palforgia drug, is that, can that combination potentially make the peanut oral immunotherapy safer? Can it help you build up faster? Can it make it a, a better treatment overall? So that's another study that is ongoing. And, and that may be sort of a, a area for the future as well of, of a combination of medications that help us to get the strongest and safest effect. And then finally here, um, uh, out of Australia, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, Mimi Tang, uh, and her group looked at probiotic peanut oral immunotherapy, or PPOIT, using a uh, proprietary probiotic combined with the peanut oral immunotherapy. And um, their data suggests that there is a uh, more lasting effect that comes with having the probiotic, essentially trying to set up the, the immune um, background that they give the peanut OIT on top of as well. So definitely some areas that we're going to be excited to see what may be coming in the next few years. Um, and then just biologics uh, seem to be really the rage across all of allergy and food allergies no different. And so part of our COFAR group here, uh, we're currently conducting a study that's called Outmatch. And what this is looking at is anti-IgE therapy, so in this case with the omeluzumab medication, and seeing if that can treat multi-food allergic patients. So people that are allergic to peanut plus a few of the other highly allergenic foods, milk, egg, tree nuts, and seeing if anti-IgE therapy can actually treat all of those simultaneously. And then we're studying that compared to multi-OIT, so creating an OIT mixture of those foods that they may be allergic to. Um, and so this will be exciting because uh, I think the ability to treat multiple allergens simultaneously would be tremendous because we do know that many of our patients are not allergic to just one food. Um, and so first of all, they would be allergic to multiple foods uh, but on top of that, too, some, some not, not just some, many of our patients are going to be allergic to foods that maybe are not peanut. And, uh, you know, when will it be when we get a sesame treatment or when will it be when we get a cashew treatment? And so to have a, a therapy that isn't necessarily allergen specific would be uh, tremendous for patients like that. And then going back to Regeneron and their dupilumab medication, they're uh, simultaneously studying it uh, as a monotherapy. So not only in combination with OIT, but can perhaps... Uh, in knocking out the TH2 side of uh, the cytokines, can that also be a therapy for peanut allergy as well? So um, a lot of really exciting types of research that are coming and I think really showing sort of essentially what uh, food allergy treatment 2.0 is going to start looking like for us. This is not necessarily treatment, but two other uh, points that I do want to make uh, about where food allergy research is going. So one of them is, again, a COFAR study that um, is set to be a, uh, being one of the sites, I'm going to say potentially overwhelming uh, study, but a very, very, very important study. So we're trying to actually create an observational birth cohort uh, of food allergy in the U.S. Um, birth cohorts similar to this have been done in other countries. We've learned tremendous amounts from those. Um, but I do think, and I think all of us um, uh, folks at the at COFAR and the NIH agree that, uh, or think that, it will be important to see what the, the U.S. experience is going to be and what does food allergy look like and can we figure out why it's happening and then get in there and try to stop that. And so this is um, a very exciting collaboration that all of our sites are having with our OB um, colleagues because uh, we're trying to identify um, families ahead of time and then track them through birth. Uh, collecting samples all the way through uh, those first couple years of life to look at the, the development of food allergy. And again, trying to figure out what are the predictors of this um, to be able to guide our future treatment. Second, I do want to bring up the FAIR patient registry. So FAIR has put a tremendous amount of effort into getting this registry off the ground. And again, just to be able to know who are these allergic people that are out there, what are their characteristics, um, you know, I think these are going to be important um, bits of information that we'll need in order to really guide sort of where our treatment um, studies go in the future as well. And so just to conclude, uh, food allergies reached epidemic proportions, like I told you, and, um, and really, again, there are significant health, social, and economic effects uh, beyond um, that really affect these families strongly. And for many of these patients, a treatment is absolutely necessary or, or desired. <laughs> Until recently, avoidance was the only option, but like I mentioned, back in January of this year, uh, the peanut OIT formulation Palforzia received the FDA approval, so an exciting time for food allergy, and we'll have to see sort of what this looks like as our clinics start to roll this out. 
At the same time, uh, sublingual and epicutaneous immunotherapy for peanut allergy are also rapidly advancing. And um, again, still probably at least a couple of years away, if not longer, but we're starting to learn a lot there as well and um, be hopeful that these can be potential options for patients where maybe oral immunotherapy doesn't quite make sense. Um, and then sort of that next level pass, these different versions, these modified immunotherapies, this immunotherapy plus that I mentioned, as well as the new biologics that seem to be coming into our field, will be really, really important and exciting to see how they can fit into our field of, aller uh, of food allergy as well. And so with that, um, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for your attention um, and, uh, and going on sort of this ride across the different types of food allergy treatment. I want to highlight our UNC Food Allergy Initiative, which has grown into a pretty significant group of 25 plus uh, folks here across our different investigators. Of course, uh, Dr. Burks, who has been studying food allergy uh, for so many years and has been my mentor to, and really been pivotal in getting me to where I am today. Um, Allison Burbank, Scott Cummins, and Onir Walla support the research as investigators, and I couldn't do it without them. We've had uh, many great fellows participate and really learn tremendous amounts from uh, the food allergy work that we're doing, both at the clinical as well as at the immunological level. Um, we're very fortunate to have five very, very strong study coordinators with Lauren Hurley leading that group. Um, and then our basic science lab is pretty tremendous with Mike Coolis as a senior scientist. And they're not only doing the mechanistic work behind the clinical trials, but also through mouse models and other novel research trying to, again, understand the mechanisms of food allergy. And then finally, I'll just highlight down here um, a unique aspect of our group that I'm very proud of is we have a GMP manufacturing area. And what you see actually pictured there is peanut oral immunotherapy. So Anusha Penomardi has led a group there that, under FDA regulations, has been creating the peanut oral immunotherapy and the other food oral immunotherapies, as well as our sublingual treatments, uh, in order for us to use in these um, uh, clinical trials to understand what's happening there. So, um, again, a fantastic group that's helped us to get to where we are, and, um, and we're excited to see what the future brings. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, seems like everyone is still absorbing the information. Um, no questions right now, so I'm guessing they can just um, email you if they have other questions. Please, yes. Uh, I'm, again, I'm happy to take any kind of questions that, that come up, uh, email, text, call, whatever you need to do. Um, and uh, again, thank you everyone for having me. All right, have a good weekend. Okay.